Hello and welcome to another Ask UCN Anything and in this special episode we welcome James Hayden to the set. Hey. We've got heaps of your questions for James who is fresh from not only completing but winning his second transcontinental race in a row. So we'll be getting onto those in just a second but remember to leave your questions for us for next week's show using the hashtag TalkBack or for your chance to win a three month free subscription to Zwift use the hashtag AskGCN training with your training questions. Now, before we get into it, James, could you just explain a little bit about what the transcontinental race is? Cool, yeah, definitely. So I've done it four times now, uh, so I know a lot about it. Yep. Essentially, it's a self-supported solo, if you are solo or pair, race across Europe. Yep. No third party kind of resupply, so you can't call your mate up and ask him to bring you a sandwich in the middle of the night. You've got to find a <laughs> petrol station that's open. Cool. We start in Hedersburgen in Belgium, <laughs> and we race to Greece. Normally, can change. Wow. Yeah. Through four checkpoints across Europe, it's normally around 4,000 kilometers long with around 35 to 45 was two years ago meters of climbing. So it's uh, pretty serious. Yeah. Uh, first one there wins. Great, and that was you for two yeah. years. So who better to speak to yeah. about the race? Right, so let's get cracking. And we've got one from Anna here who is the race organizer. Anna asks, how long does he spend researching and planning his route? How important is a well-planned and researched route over fitness or bike setup? So this is a bit of a setup by Anna here because it's a really important thing and I think she's asked the question so that people entering the race for the first time, those at home understand just how serious route planning and research okay. is to completing the race and, and not having any issues. Mm -hmm. um, and also for safety and things like that because yeah, we do absolutely. plan all of our own routes and so mm -hmm. you can make that choice at home if you're gonna take the fast route because it's gonna get there really quickly yeah. or take the maybe slightly longer route but it's a lot more scenic roads. And you know, if you're not yeah. racing for a top 10 position and you're just trying to get there before the party, could you just go a slightly nicer way? Yeah. And so I spend about, this year was about 70 hours planning my route. Wow. And I look at all <laughs> the options, all the different, so I plan this year it was about four routes Okay. And then I'll kind of work out which one is best and, and which one I'm feeling the most. And I will look at so many different map sources. You know, I'm even on YouTube Googling road names. And uh, as I've done it more times, I can spend less time doing it because I understand what certain roads are like in, okay. in Eastern Get European a bit of countries. A feel for yeah, it. definitely. So, but over fitness and bike setup, they're, they're both, it, it's equally important. Mm. I'd rather have a better route than be a bit fitter. I, really? I'll put it that way. Yeah. yeah. Definitely something you don't want to learn the hard way. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> We've got one from Fredo here. What is your way of training for these types of events? Do you do any long rides or multi-day trips or do you just do a few and rely on your prior experience? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's changed as I've done more races. Obviously, yeah. now I've done four, uh, I can rely on my experience more and I also understand how my body works mm. and how certain training works for me. Um, to, to everyone, I'd say that you need to find what's fun for you. Yeah. And if, if, you're, if you're, if the kind of training you're doing you enjoy, then you should do more of that and you will do more of it. So don't get a coach and then them say to you, you know, you need to train like this if you don't enjoy it. But at the same time, I have a coach because I, I train a lot and I know how to train really hard. And he almost kind of says to me, look, you know, we need to do a bit less. We need yeah. to do, you know, a little bit less because I have a propensity to be able to go out and hurt myself quite a lot. And that's not necessarily the best way to train. So find what you enjoy, do a lot of it, and you will be fit. And that's that's good enough. Yeah. And am I right in thinking that you come from a slightly different background to perhaps most in the ultra endurance? Sort yeah, of I mean, I always say to people, I've never done an Ordax. And I kind of like, you know, I'm quite proud of that. <laughs> you, don't, you don't necessarily need to have done Ordaxes yeah. to do this. But I, I always go away touring and went away touring for several years before this and you know pretty like long days in the saddle and then did some really long long days in the saddle to prepare so yeah you do need that experience on your yeah. belt and how to understand how to ride for day after day but at the same time you don't necessarily need to do that to train for the race. Okay so coming back to that touring point do you ever go on long bike tours for fun asks Mike Peace. If so what do you consider in your planning for them and where would be your dream bike trip? Cause there's like three questions in one there. Okay, so <laughs> do I go on like bike, uh, long bike tours for fun? Mm -hmm. Yes, not as much as I'd like to anymore because they're not the best way to train. Okay. So I'm going on one next week actually, we're going to Italy, to, yeah. to Tuscany and traveling through Tuscany for a week and uh, it's just all about fun and getting yeah. lost. And so, the question, which brings us to the second part, uh, what do you consider planning? I haven't done much planning because the whole point is adventure for that. So my yeah, route okay. is just nicked off someone else and I've made up half of it and if we get lost, perfect. That's really, I want to get yeah. completely lost. And that's what I'm trying to do. Is and that like a training aspect? So then you can cope with what happens? No, it's just for fun, you know, because yeah. you, you, you find the best things when you get lost and when you're just off the trails yeah. and when you, you know, yeah, and that, yeah. That, that's when it's fun. Okay. So that's completely the opposite of what you want in the race. So yeah. I'm looking for that adventure that I can't get when racing. Yeah. Uh, my dream bike trip. 
I want to see the whole world, so I, I'm going to say the whole world traveling the whole world by bike. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Right, next we have one in from Kevin Spite. Assuming he has times where he struggles mentally, what is his strategy for a mental reset to refocus and get back on track? Good question. So I'd refer everyone that's entered the race to go and look in the race manual because in the back of the race manual, it says never scratch at night. Okay. And that's kind of a, it's a rule. If like, if, if you would have called Mike up on the phone trying to scratch at nighttime and he said, no, 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 I'm not, I can't talk to you right now, I'm busy. And and, and, and so cut, call back in the morning and daylight, you know, and, and I could, if it's serious, he wouldn't hang up on you. But you know, he, he wouldn't really take a scratch at nighttime. And it's because everything seems worse at night. Yeah. But if you wait until the, the daylight and the daytime and if you've had a good sleep and probably a good feed as well, mm. hopefully, you know, stopped at a nice hotel and, you're, and it's just gonna, that's really gonna help you reset. And you wake up the next day and you think, what was the problem yesterday? Well, you know, what was, you know, oh, my knees don't feel so bad. You're gonna feel a lot better because you've had a good sleep and you've had a good feed and that's, that is, so yeah, those are the two things. Sleep well, okay. eat well, and just, just that will allow you to reset. And, and if you can't do that, put on some good music that's gonna transport yeah. you back to a, a really good memory. Okay, so next up we've got Chris Webb who asks, between your previous attempt, when he withdrew to, due to Shermer's neck, which is a weakness in the muscles, so unable to support weight of the head, were there specific strength exercises that he did to avoid that again? Can we flick to the photo? Like, let's flick to the photo. <laughs> because everyone can see the like, okay, so, yeah. cause you can either go on Google and type like James Hayden, Sherman's neck or something like, I think it's like the first photo if you type my name anyway. Nice. Everyone thinks I have the secret answer to Sherman's neck and they come to me okay. and they go, James, what did you do to fix Sherman's neck? Fix it for me right now. And I kind of had to say, well, there's no one answer. It's not one of these things where you can go to the doctor and he prescribes you this pill mm -hmm. and it's fixed. It's, it doesn't work like that. So. For those that don't know what happens with Shaman's neck is the, the muscles down the back of the neck here stop working. And you know, if you're standing up, it doesn't matter, but it happens when you're cycling because yeah. the weight is a bit different. And then your neck's like this. And you, if you lift it up, it just collapses again like this. Yeah. And so you can't see it. And then you can't see down the road. So it's quite dangerous from mm -hmm. that perspective. And then it caused me some back pain when I had it and things as well. So I, that's why I scratched. Um, there's no one way to fix it. You know, you, you've got to think about everything that could possibly affect your neck muscles and strain them, yeah. and then do something to deal with that, you know, whether that's the weight of your helmet, the airiness of your helmet, the kit and the way the kit compresses around your neck, um, the, the strength of your muscles, so doing neck exercises and things like that, and I went to see a physio, and we, okay. we worked some stuff out. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the bike fit is definitely Position a big bike, one as well, yeah. that's a massive one, and, and you know, where the arms are, where, you and know, And did that change much backwards. between your recent? Yeah. You know, if I've had the same fit for three years now, more or okay. less. We moved it a little bit because everything changes each year, yeah. or a little things change each year. But uh, yeah, for the last few years since I got a new bike fit, then it stayed the same. Okay. So, so it's obviously working for you, those combinations yeah, of different things. Yeah, you've got to just try lots of different mm. things and, and hope one of them or a few of them together work. Yeah. Next up, we have one from David Fairweather. For how many days do you think that riding, that this sort of minimal stationary time can be sustained for? Is t around 10 days, so the transcontinental length, yeah. almost the limit, or could he double that? Sounds like a good challenge, doesn't it? Sounds like a challenge. I think uh, I think it's an interesting question. I think stationary time and being stopped and, and limiting that is a mental thing. Okay. It's not it's not a physical thing. You know, physically stopping to, to buy some food and seeing how many, you don't really need to do that. It's, it's mental. And so if you're mentally strong, then you can keep doing that exponentially, I think. Because it's just it's just mentally tiring that and it's it's not much fun, but you exponentially. Physically, as you start to stretch things out and the race duration gets longer, you're gonna have find that you just need to sleep a little bit more. So if you went okay. to sort of 20 days or 30 days, three hours a night might not be sustainable. And you might need to go to five or, or a mixture yeah. of the two. Uh, yeah, e exponentially, really. It's sleep that you're gonna have to kind of change rather than stop time, if you're mentally strong. Patricia Henley asks, how much of a success is down to mental preparation and how can that be practiced alongside all the hours climbing in the mountains? Yeah, I mean, like I have to say to people that the first three days of the race are maybe about being physically fit, but then after that it becomes about being mentally fit. And if, mm. you're, if you're strong up here, then you can just hang on in push there. through anything. Yeah, yeah hang on in because <laughs> it is hanging in. Yeah. Or you push through anything. I think maybe how you train that differs for everyone. Perhaps mm. some people, it, it is just, you are born with that, you know, you're born with, uh, you know, your pain threshold of seven being someone else's like, you know, 10. So you yeah. can just sustain more. Can you train it? Yeah, you can as well, I think, to a limit. H how? Obviously, if you're out riding in the rain and things, that sucks, but it might make yeah. you be able to endure things a bit more. You know, the more you suffered previously, the more you can suffer in the future because you can go back to that place. So after I'd done one TCR, I understood how that pain would feel and how, how it would feel to get to the end. And then I knew how that would feel. So I knew if I'd done it before, I could do it again. 
so experience mm -hmm. of it. Um, but I think I think being the ability to suffer or the willingness and the want to suffer is something that you're possibly just born with on some level. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we've got a good one here from Rico. Um, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that. Apologies, Rico. I'd be interested in the way that Edie Harrison, so the woman who, who won the women's category, and James and all the other riders are dealing with recovery. So after the race, does everyone sleep to sleep a lot? How do you cope with the physical effects of weight loss, random sweats, nightmares and other things? Maybe even the mental aftermath, like post-adventures blues and settling back into your everyday life. Yeah, uh, it, it, he's kind of like pointed out the post-adventure blues, which maybe encompasses a lot of that. Mm. Often when you've put everything into one thing and worked for that for a long time, like a year here, yeah, really. Absolutely. When you're finished, it's like, you, you lose your identity a bit because he's he's mentioned recovery and things like that. So to recover, you can't really go out riding a bike. So for a year, you've ridden your bike every day really hard to yeah. prepare, and now you can't ride your bike. So you lose your identity a bit. Okay. Uh, and you're, you know, you're eating a lot to, to kind of recover and so you put on a bit of weight. So you could become a person you're not. And so mm. you completely lose your identity. And so that, that really can hit you a bit, you know. My, yeah. I think the best way to deal with stuff like that is is to do two things. One, you need to recover and respect that. Yeah. So do just take it easy and chill out. Don't try and go ride your bike a lot and do these other things because you need that physically yeah. and mentally as well. And then secondly, keep yourself busy with other things. Find something else. Like, you know, if you if you haven't been away on holiday for a while because you've been so, you know, engrossed in training for TCR and the preparation, because it takes it, yeah. it takes over your life. I can imagine. Go away on holiday, book a holiday for after the race. You know, give it a week so you can come home, relax, and then go away again and do, do a holiday again. You know, if you've got to do, go back to work, take on a new project at work. Okay, one's not going to be too intense because yeah. you're still pretty tired, <laughs> but something that you can invest your time and energy in because you obviously, if you're doing TCR, you have a lot of time and energy and this counts for any kind of other person mm. doing adventures. And if you can't invest that into something, you're going to get lost. And yeah. so find something to invest your energy into and it's really going to help you mentally recover that's yeah. that's not bicycles. So yeah. then you can come back feeling refreshed. And I guess having something planned in ahead of yeah. when you go away is probably a good thing to have something to look forward to. Yeah, so so in the period after the race this year, I've like done these kind of media things. I'm trying to search for a new flat because we've got to move. I'm starting a new job. I'm going away on holiday. I'm then getting married and then I'm going away on honeymoon. And this is in the period so, of like yeah, four weeks, <laughs> four, four weeks. So I wouldn't recommend taking on quite as much as I've taken yeah. on. You know, it's kind of lucky I am who I am, but <laughs> definitely take some stuff on and, and just getting stuck into different things. Cool, that sounds like solid advice. Yeah. And we've got another one here from Vince Gerard. Vince says, with so little time stationary, how do you still manage to use hotels every night? What were his typical check-in and check-out times? Maybe he's asking for my secret right here. I can't, I can't, I can't give away all my trade secrets, but like you just got to think about these things logically on, on how you reduce your time uh, and, and time that you're faffing and things like that. Everyone's different, so people faff in different ways, and I'm also not going to give up all my secrets. But I, I'd say that uh, within walking into the front of a hotel and being in my room is less than like five minutes, sometimes yeah. two, you know. And how you do that, you've got to work out your own way. Uh, I won't tell you my way. <laughs> but it's just about being efficient and just about thinking about things, you know, how can I how can I be more efficient and how can I make this process quicker? Um, yeah, I'm not telling you my secrets. <laughs> <laughs>Right, let's move on to our Zwift training segment where we answer one of your training specific questions for your chance to win a three month subscription to Zwift. And the lucky winner today is HFODT, who asks, I would like to prepare for longer 250 to 300 kilometer rides. The ultimate goal is twofold, to ride around a big loop here in Sweden and to get ready for long distance touring. Time is not the goal here, comfort on the bike is, and endurance. I usually cramp at about 200 kilometers. How do I train for this? Now, I think between us, James, we're probably uh, quite well qualified to answer this one. I spent the first half of this year uh, training for the Dirty Kanza, which is a 330 kilometer uh, race in just one day over in the States. Um, I think the answer to it is really twofold. It's about pacing yourself during the training and about the nutrition. So the first one on pacing, um, I think the most important thing when you're going out for really long, long day rides is to stay within yourself. So you might go out with friends, for example, who are a bit stronger than you. I was certainly guilty of doing this and trying to keep up. And you're sort of running at this level whilst they're quite chilled down here, but that actually is gonna tire you out so much more um, than just sticking at a really reasonable uh, level for yourself. Yeah, I think 
like you don't need to just train at the level that you want to ride at when you're yeah. when you're riding. It's best just to mix things up because some days you might have an hour to go out riding, and some days you've got six. And yeah. so if you've got an hour, just go on. You can ride pretty hard for an hour, and that's mm -hmm. that's good training. And then because so, you're going to have to climb some places, and that'll you know help you learn to climb. And if you've got six hours and you enjoy going out for that long, then then, then go out for that long if you you know four hours or, or yeah. however you can, and just build that up. You know, so week on week do a bit more. Um, yeah, you know, and, and some days you've got to take it easy, haven't you? So. Absolutely. And I think it's really important to stress that even if your target is a 300 kilometre ride, you're not going to go out and do that straight away. <laughs> it's all about building up to it from where you are now. Um, and then think about perhaps doing about two thirds of the duration or of the distance of your target event um, very close to the time of the event. Um, so you're going to build up week on week and you might take one weekend, for example, if you work during the week, uh, doing a longer ride and then during the second weekend having a shorter, more intense ride and building up from there. Um, but it definitely does help to do it over time, yeah. gradually. You said about nutrition as well and here's mm. an important point because a lot of people don't eat enough when they're riding Absolutely. or they think, oh, I can get by with not eating much. But when you're less fit, you actually need to eat more because your body's uh, less efficient and it's burning more carbohydrates and things at a, at a lower intensity. And so people always think, oh, I carry so much luggage on my bike and stuff, but actually my triangle frame bag, yeah. it's just water and food. Yeah. You know, I've got a pump in there and a few inner tubes, but, but otherwise it's water and food yeah. because I don't want to run out of food. If you run out of food, you mm -hmm. can't keep going. And so it's important to always have food on you and on the bike. Okay, don't eat it all in the first hour because you're going to get fat, yeah. but like <laughs> just, 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 just ration it out and just always, yeah. always be eating something. And then you've always got energy going into you. And I, I, I like putting a like sugar amount of dextrin and fructose in my drinks. Yeah. And then I'm always getting that carbohydrate that I like yeah. in. I mean, some people do low carb and, and things like that, but I like carbohydrates because yeah. they fuel me. And just make sure you're always, always getting some fuel in. And yeah. that's really important. And when we talked about the transcontinental, pretty much on the start line with you, James, I remember you saying it's almost an eating competition. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you can I mean, keep eating and fueling the longest. Yeah, yeah. The first the day fastest. I burnt 14,000 calories and I went on to burn 75 in nine days. Wow. And you can't eat that much. That's yeah. why you lose four or five kilos um, during the race. Crazy. And uh, you, so you just got to eat as much as you can. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the other point in there was about the cramps in about 200k mark and um, probably worth trying some electrolyte in your drink for that. Um, a few other things that you can lick into. Um, I remember when I was over in, um, in the States in Kansas for the Dirty Kansas, they even had um, salt tabs that tasted of orange and had something that we never even come across here because yeah. it's never really that hot. <laughs> it's no. usually raining. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there's a few other things that you could look into for that. Right, and now we're going back to your questions for James, and there's so many here that we're gonna go for a quick fire round. Are you ready, James? Uh, maybe, I think so. We'll see, we'll <laughs> that's, see. That's not very promising, yeah. is it? My brain's still not working, so we'll see how quickly <laughs> it can work. Okay, here we go, you ready? Now I have to just explain this one. This one's from Rene Bon, who we actually spoke to at the start of Transcontinental. Some incredible handmade uh, carbon fiber bags. Anyway, Rene asks, what music is on your TCR playlist? Uh, a bit of everything, because you need different stuff for different times. So I love Dire Straits, so, so I could listen to Dire Straits all day. That's the one. Marion uh, asks, one piece of advice you'd give to a first time tcr -er? Um Research, plan your route, respect the race, and just make sure you're putting in the time to it. That's it not deserves. one piece of advice. Uh, respect the race. <laughs> Pete Robson, I'd be keen to know his dog tactics. Is he a dog whisperer or is he just too fast for them? Um, run away, scared, yeah, quickly, sprint. <laughs> Stuart James, what's his favourite flavour of seven days croissants? And for viewers that might not know the delights of seven days, he can explain why they're a great ultra endurance food. Uh, quick fire, they're disgusting and everyone hates them and they're a running joke. And uh, the ones with chocolate in the middle because I like chocolate the most. Excellent. And lastly, uh, but not least in our quick fire round, will he be back to defend his double title? Uh, you have to wait and see. <laughs> and now oh, we can relax, that's over thankfully. But I have another interesting one here. So if you watched the GCN show a few weeks ago, we featured James's hack or slash bodge and the jury was out on this one. Sai threatened to ask you this question himself, but he's sunning himself in California. It's a hard life. So Sai wanted to ask. Why would you put tape on the outside of your tire? Why not? No, why not? Like, you know, put tape on the inside, Gorilla Tape. Yeah. Other tapes are available. <laughs> and it sticks It sticks really, really well. Put two layers of that on the inside, and then, so that's stuck, and yeah. it's not the, It's not going to open. So why not just put one more on the outside? Gorilla Tape will stick, why it's not, not going to come off, and it's just going to protect yeah. it a bit more. And how far did you get on that one? I rode 550k, and uh, you can go into the, the raffle shop, and it's still actually on there, because uh, I'm not taking it off. It's so it took you to the end of the race. Yeah, so it worked. And in winning form. 
I think that's a hack. Me too. I was in the middle of Albania. I think that deserves a hack. If I was in my garage at home, I'd give that a bodge, but in the middle of Albania... When Sai comes back, we'll tell him it's a hack. It's a hack. <laughs> it's a hack. And finally, to finish with, uh, we've got one here from Matt Crickshank. Ask him to make sure Christoph races next year. So Christoph's won the race three times. So that we can have a head-to-head -head between them. It's the obvious face-off that we all want to see. What do you think, James? Uh, I don't know why you're asking me. Ask Christoph. Yeah. That'd be a good race, wouldn't it? Ask Christoph. Well, thank you very much for joining us, James. That's been a really fascinating insight as to what it takes to be at the very top level of ultra endurance racing. Remember that if you want to leave your questions for next week's Ask GCN Anything, to use the hashtag TalkBack and leave them in the comments below. And if you'd like to be in with the chance of winning a three month subscription to Zwift, use your training question with a hashtag Ask GCN Training. Remember to head over to the GCN shop if you'd like to check out our cool new Spanish tees as modeled here and much more. And if you've enjoyed our Ask with James, remember to give us a thumbs up. And if you want to check about a bit more about my uh, bike and the setup on that, find out a bit more about how I'm running it, you can uh, click up here and go to that video now. <laughs>